welcome to the second rotation of El Museo del Barrio's permanent collection exhibition, Something Beautiful, Reframing La Colección, which initially opened to the public in May. This is the museum's most ambitious display of its permanent collection in over 20 years. The second rotation expands the exhibition's scope, showcasing approximately 150 additional artworks by some 60 artists, including 50 new acquisitions that have entered the collection within the last two years. Something Beautiful cuts across chronological, geographic, and media-specific categories, reconsidering the collection through interdisciplinary approaches rooted in El Museo's history and legacy. Within this model, the contributions of Amerindian, African, and European presences, as well as other diasporic flows, are the basis of visual culture in the Americas and the Caribbean. The exhibition presents key themes that investigate the complex and nuanced ways in which artists respond to the particular histories of the Americas. We hope this exhibition demonstrates El Museo's commitment to collecting and exhibiting the artists of our time. We're thrilled to continue something beautiful with new thematic sections that feature recent acquisitions alongside iconic works. Presented together for the first time, these works attest to the continued evolution, growth, and resonance of El Museo's permanent collection. The works in this section were produced by artists in the African diasporas in the Americas. All of them are associated with spirituality and religious practices of the Black Atlantic, such as Candomblé, Umbanda, Voodoo, and Santeria. Together, they propose parallels and dialogues between visual cultures of Afro-Atlantic territories. Some of these works evoke spiritual leaders, rituals, and forces, including Orishas of the Yoruba tradition, while others appropriate Western artistic idioms to subject them to an Afro-diasporic visual language. Still others draw from craft traditions originally used to make liturgical objects such as metal sculptures and drapos. In their geographic, material, and chronological diversity, this grouping highlights the colonized and less Eurocentric modernities in the Americas and the Caribbean. Edgardo Jimenez is known for his involvement with the development of pop art in Argentina. The posters presented here were designed as announcements for exhibitions, as ephemera for his happenings, and as large edition multiples. They showcase his characteristic use of his body in high contrast and psychedelic colors, with an irreverent mix of eroticism and humor. Jimenez was also an active participant in the Instituto Torquato de Tella, which brought together avant-garde artists in Buenos Aires in the 1960s. In 1970, he helped found the design store Fuera de Caja, or Out of the Box, which made mass-produced art objects for general audiences. The use of political figureheads has been a key visual strategy for artists fighting for Puerto Rican independence. A large grouping of paintings, prints, and posters in this gallery focuses on two nationalist leaders, Pedro Alviso Campos and Lolita Lebron, who are active between the 1930s and the 1970s. Their images offer a chronicle of the revolutionary movement, as well as the colonial relations between the United States and Puerto Rico. Other works expand these references to other artistic languages, political movements, figures, and imagery of the Americas, from pop to populism, from Simón Bolívar to José Martí. In this graphic, sculpture, woven, and video works, scale, color, shape and line are employed to confer new perspectives on historical narratives. Borrowing its title from the hit anthem by Boricua rap duo The Latin Empire, Así es la Vida celebrates the Puerto Rican and Latinx roots of New York's urban culture. Encompassing hip-hop, DJing, and street art, this section affirms a lifestyle that transcends art and music and is today a part of the rhythm and fashion of the city. Featuring photographs, drawings, and paintings, the works on view focus on graffiti and its legacy. 
These include snapshots from the 1980s that represent tags and portraits of a community of aerosol artists, some of whom are captured in drawings by Antonio Lopez. Many of the images document pieces that have long been erased from the streets and subways. Presented here, these works allude to the shift of graffiti from its original underground status to its position as a widely embraced cultural commodity. Concrete, bricks, discarded furniture, and other urban detritus are used to make the artworks in this section material construction. Sourced from the street, these unconventional materials reflect the constant flux of construction and demolition, growth and decay that characterizes places like New York, Mexico City, and San Juan where these works were produced. The earliest dated work on view is by El Museo's founder, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, whose surroundings in post-war Manhattan's Lower East Side inspired his influential approach to destruction in art. Uptown, Jorge Soto Sanchez salvaged materials from the streets of East Harlem for his sculptural practice. Representing a younger generation working globally, works by Gabriel Orozco and Abraham Cruz Villegas find poetry in city fragments. The city was an important muse for Sophie Rivera, the subject of this artist's spotlight. Rivera traversed New York City's boroughs, taking photographs of its people and places. Here, a suite of images feature dirty boots, muddy track marks, and oozing sludge. Elusive and nearly abstract, these photographs revel in the textures of the city's dirt and grime and allude to unseen labor and the entropic state between construction and ruin. Throughout her career, Rivera was engaged with numerous cultural organizations, including El Museo del Barrio, Enfoco, and the Feminist Heresies Collective. Although best known for her portraits of her New Yorican neighbors, Rivera's experimental production spanned genres and subjects. The subway also played an important role in her work, and her fascination with its graffiti culture is exemplified in a photograph on view elsewhere in this room as part of the section Así es la vida. The embroidered fabric objects known as arpilleras displayed on this wall symbolize resistance to political oppression. Made in Chile during Augusto Pinochet's military dictatorship, most of them were created by women in communal workshops in Santiago, one of which you can see here, that also served as social support networks. The makers of arpietas, who were typically the wives and mothers of the many people disappeared during this period, often carried their creations in marches as a form of protest. Some of their designs depict these street actions, while others describe more intimate scenes of loss and uncertainty. Arpilleras were smuggled out of Chile by aid workers and sold internationally to support their makers and fund the resistance movement. This section is titled Tropical Extraction, and the works here examine and critique natural resource extraction and commodification in Latin America and the Caribbean. Alluding to a colonial past, these histories include representations of the region and its resources for external consumption and circulation. Photographs by Alfredo Jar and Miguel Rio Branco allude to the environmental destruction and human rights abuses surrounding illegal mining. These images of gold and its exploitation by the hegemonic powers of the global north are in conversation with iconography of other tropical commodities, including oil and plantains. Francisco Ollier's celebrated painting showcasing these fruits for 19th century French audiences is referenced in Justin Favela's playful remix, itself a critique of the exoticization of the Mexican piñata in the United States. The act of classifying individuals according to the color of their skin and ethnic background was a strategy widely used by the colonial enterprise in the Americas. This history continues to have a direct impact on our experience of race today. The works in this section deal with racial systems, and with ways to subvert them through conceptual gestures. The colors in Adriana Varejão's paint box come from a 1976 racial census in Brazil in which participants were invited to describe their own color. Varejão selected those responses with the most metaphoric evocativeness, such as sapecada, which could translate as flirting with freckles, and café con leite, 
Milky Coffee. Gabriel de la Mora combines images found online of individuals dead and alive whose names are Juan Perez. The mosaic format creates a kind of collective portrait that interrogates Latino identity. Pepono Sorio's artistic practice references cultural rituals and the dynamics of public and private spaces that are of special significance to his fellow Puerto Ricans. His installations are embellished with a myriad of elements, including toys, beads, and personal mementos that make up his unique aesthetics of excess. In La Cama, a bedspread is covered with capias, which are gifted as party favors on important occasions such as weddings and baptisms. This work is a tribute to Juana Hernandez, the woman who served as a spiritual guide and caretaker to Osorio throughout his childhood in Puerto Rico. Osorio has described this artwork as an attempt to posthumously give Juana material opulence to make up for what was often a lonely and difficult life. The artists in the Craft Crossroads section engage with a wide range of techniques that fall under the still contentious category of craft. Some artworks in this room reference regional artisan traditions, such as the serape of northern Mexico and huichil basket making, in order to maintain and expand on these visual languages and to critique systems of colonialism. Other works here evoke domestic skills often associated with femininity, such as embroidery and pastry making, and emphasize the artistry and wisdom of generations of women. These artworks reclaim knowledge, labor, and skills that have been historically marginalized to challenge power structures and hegemonic value judgments. Together, they complicate the distinctions between so-called high art and popular culture, insisting on the centrality of craft. The paintings, collages, installation proposals, and videos in this room encompass the many strategies that Jaime Davidovich developed to short circuit the inherent commodification of the art market. After moving to New York City in the wake of the 1962 military coup in Argentina, he became involved with the downtown experimental art scene and began using adhesive tape as a central material element. Like his direct applications of tape to the built environment, Davidovich's pioneering videos attune viewers to the unexpected. As the artist stated, quote, for me, videotape was similar to packing tape. The reel going on and on, the sense of time. I got involved in video because of the tape. With the live show, the artist's alter ego, Dr. Videovich, brought avant-garde performance into viewers' homes as the host of a variety show on public access TV.